Hello, everyone. Logging in. My name is Josh Gilliland. I'm the chair of the Sea Scout Marketing and Communications Subcommittee. Thank you for joining us this evening. And we are getting our live stream up and running. So stand by as we launch that. And we will begin momentarily. We are connecting. And we are live on Facebook as well. So it is 1800 Pacific. I want to thank everyone who's joined us live. Those who are gonna be watching uh, on, on the uh, recording, good to have you with us. This is our first Sea Scout webinar of 2022. And for this Coast Guard Tech Talk, we have PJ O'Neill with us. And I'm gonna turn it over to PJ so he can begin tonight's program, PJ. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm PJ O'Neill, and I am the branch chief for STEM training in youth programs in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. And I'm very excited to start off 2022 with this particular tech talk. It'll give us a lot to think about and a lot to do while our boats may be shrink wrapped for the season or on dry dock or somewhere safe out of the weather. Or perhaps you're in a warmer climate and you are still out on the water in which case this information is going to be um, relevant to you immediately. So I won't talk about too much what I do um, in the auxiliary outside of the STEM training, uh, but I will mention just because it will uh, make a little bit more sense in the presentation. Um, one thing that I do in the auxiliary is participate in a program called Aux Culinary Assistance. Now I know that has nothing to do with ship's station bills or ship safety drills, or so it seems. That'll be important a little bit later on. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I do wanna let you know that um, the chat is being monitored for questions, but I won't be able to see the questions and answer them as we go. So we'll save some time at the end if you have questions. This um, tech talk is also being recorded. So again, if you're here live, fantastic. If you're watching this at a later date at your convenience or with friends or members of your ship, that's wonderful as well. All right, I'm just waiting for my first slide to load here. Get the content. So our goal today, at the end of this tech talk, you'll be able to develop a ship's station bill and review it with an adult leader. And that's important because you'll need a ship's bill to effectively plan and practice the following drills. Fire, abandon ship, and man overboard. So what is a ship's bill or a station bill? You'll see both terms sometimes. So I've presented it three different ways here. In simple English, it's just, a, it's just a set of assigned duties for each crew member in the event of an emergency. I see I have a, I have a typo here. It should be event of an emergency. No, but that's the plain language, right? Everyone has a job when something goes wrong to try and fix the situation to the best of their abilities. I also included this snippet. This is from the CFR's Code of Federal Regulations. Now it doesn't really apply to us per se, but for commercial vessels and government vessels, it's actually in federal code that a ship must have station bills. And so that's a little bit more of a, of a deep explanation of what a station bill is. But in plain language, it's a set of assigned duties to specific crew members, where they go, what they do, and what they are responsible for 
in an emergency. So when you have a ship bill, or a station bill, as I'm going to start referring to it for the rest of the tech talk, when you have a station bill, you're able to plan effective safety drills. And just think about it this way. Many of us, if not all of us, have been in a school at one time, and there's a fire drill, and there's a procedure, right? There's an order to things. Certain classes go out certain doors and certain exits, and they line up in certain places, and maybe attendance is taken and radioed, or a list of the attendance is handed in, right? Everyone has a specific job. It would be utter mayhem and could in fact make the situation worse or cause injury if there wasn't an order to that drill. So hopefully that gives you a little sense of why a station bill is important. Before a drill and before an actual emergency, it sets an order of who goes where and who is doing what. All right, so I gave you a little quiet time to just kind of look over this chart. So this chart of station bills comes from the Sea Scout manual. Uh, the manual that I used is the 12th edition, so several years old, but the information, um, the information is completely relevant for us tonight. So as we talk about ship bill, uh, station bills and the safety drills this evening, I'm trying to give you the tools to be able to create your own station bills and effectively plan and do safety drills. But I'm also gonna give you a little bit of perspective from uh, the, the Coast Guard side as well so that you can kind of make comparisons because the reality is that no matter where you're logging in from tonight, we have a vast array of vessels, right? Your ship may have several vessels. You might have one vessel. You might have to partner with another organization or be on auxiliary vessels. They could be sail powered. They could be motor powered, all different sizes, all different configurations. And so of course I can't cover in a one hour tech talk, all of the possibilities but I can give you the tools and give you a little bit of insight into how things are a little bit different compared to different types of vessels. But from the Sea Scout manual, this kind of gives you a good overview of what a small craft station bill looks like. Okay, you have your positions. In the Coast Guard, we might call those billets. You have the emergency type, and I know abandoned ship isn't on here. That's, that's okay, this is just an example. And under the emergency, say man overboard, it lines up what duties this specific position or crew member has during the drill and during an actual emergency. Okay, so just giving you a little time to look over that. Now, this is nothing that you have to memorize. Your station bill may look different. Your station bill is going to reflect the number of crew that you have on your vessel. It's going to reflect the type of vessel, the size of vessel, the configuration of your vessel. But the underlying current is to create an effective station bill, you have to line up all of your crew with their responsibilities during a specific type of emergency. Now, this is going to be mentioned a little bit later, but when you create a, sh a station bill, this is fine to have it obviously um, on your computer and phone or iPad, uh, but it is also something that you really want to have printed and on the vessel and reviewed and understood. And we'll talk a little bit um, coming up here. How do you make 
or customize your own station bill. All right, so developing a station bill for your vessel, or if you're doing it as a ship activity and you have multiple vessels, right? Take the information and figure out how you can customize it for your particular circumstance. Right, so as I'd mentioned, what do we need on a station bill? Well, you should have basic information like the vessel name, perhaps the length, power, right? Is it powered? Is it sail? But really the heart of it is the emergency types. And here's what you have to think about, right? And the emergency types we'll talk about tonight are fire, abandoned ship, and man overboard. There are other types, but those are the three we'll go over tonight. The number of crew on your vessel. If you're on a vessel that has 12 people, you're going to be able to allocate the necessary tasks during a drill and an actual emergency differently than if you're on a vessel with five people. So we have to think about the number of crew. And you have to think about each crew member's specific skills or qualifications. So in commercial and government vessels, the captain or on a commercial vessel, the vessel's master is in charge of creating the station bill. But for a Sea Scout ship, it might be more helpful to work together. Maybe you know each other really well and you can, you can identify off the top of your head what qualifications and skills all of your shipmates have. But maybe you can't. And in either case, even if you think you can, it's better to have an open and honest evaluation of everyone's skill level. And I think this will be a little bit more clear when we get into the drills. When you see the types of things that you have to do for each drill, or if you've been practicing these types of drills before, you can already think about what needs to be done and which crew member is a best fit for that assignment. And I know some, some stations, you know, someone might really want to be in that bill, but again, it's based on skills and not desire. And if I go back to the chart, there are some natural liaisons between some of the positions and their duties during an emergency or during a drill. For instance, in a man overboard, it would make sense that the helmsman starts recovery maneuvers. The helmsman is gonna to have to turn the vessel. Why would, why would we assign the helmsman to a different job? Right, so again, come back to this chart um, to try and match up position within the crew and skills to assign the necessary duties. All right, so I, I had mentioned that um, in the auxiliary is involved in a specific program. And the only reason I mentioned that is because that program has brought me aboard several cutters in my auxiliary career. And uh, while these are not all of them, these are the two biggest ones. On the left, we have the um, WMEC 902, which is the Tampa, and on the right, 912, the Laguerre. And they are 270 feet um, long and the crew, including officers, is 105. So think about a vessel of this size with dozens of compartments and spaces. How would a station bill for a vessel like this look different than perhaps a J-22 or a center console fishing boat? Now, again, I've gone to two extremes here. I know that there are all sorts of boats in between, right? Maybe a 40-foot sailing cruiser, 
maybe a cruiser cap, a cabin cruiser, right? Maybe a trawler, maybe a schooner or a sloop. There's all sorts of vessels. But it's just to make that point that when you're thinking of your station bills, which crew member is going to do what duties and where on the vessel, you're more limited when you're working on a smaller platform. You're in closer proximity. On vessels of these size, you're gonna rely on radio communications or sound power telephones if radio comms goes down. On this vessel, you're going to be talking very loudly or shouting to each other. Or when we think about emergencies such as fire, right? We have two very different engine types here. On the left, we've got the twin turbocharged Alcove 18 diesel. And on the right, we have an Ever Evinrude 115 horsepower outboard. On the surface, we look and say, wow, on the, on the turbocharged alcove, there's 18 cylinders on each of those engines. There's 36 cylinders. A lot could go wrong. This could be a massive problem. But I'd also pose the question, if you're on a smaller platform, a smaller boat, a smaller vessel, and you have a fire originating from that Evinrude, could that actually cause more damage and be more devastating than the fire that may start on the giant turbo diesel engine? It all depends, right? How bad is the fire? How quickly can you address the fire? And we'll see some comparisons throughout the presentation that might lead us to believe that that giant engine, it may be less devastating to have a small fire than to have a small fire with this Evinrude on an all fiberglass boat. And this all leads back, back to you have to customize the station bill for the number of crew that you have and the size and type of vessel that you are working on. Okay, so what are drills and why do we do them? Seems like a really simple question with a probably obvious answer. But let's take a look at this example from Boat US where they did a few test burns to try and get a deeper sense of why should we do drills. And I'll apologize in advance, I am going to stop the video at certain points. So I had an experience with my boat a few weeks ago. I'm a crabber. So I went out crabbing one morning by myself, engine idle went up. And before you knew it, I smelled something burning and I had a fair amount of fire coming out the engine part of my boat. I hope today, after we torch these three donated vessels to the Boat US Foundation, that boaters will look at their own fire safety. I really like what the foundation is doing to focus on the boat safety aspect of it. From working insurance claims and listening to people who have had fires on their boat, that constant underlying, you know, I can't believe this happened to me, or, you know, I thought I was prepared. Again, it's just a huge knowledge gap between what they, what they think they know and what they should know. Well, I'd like to see how fast the fire actually is gonna travel. I know uh, fiberglass burns fast, vigorously. Okay, so we saw, we saw coming up here, 
that there's going to be the cause of fire is going to be an electrical fire, right? And this is a controlled, uh, this is a controlled burn, a controlled scenario. It's under the supervision of the fire department at a location that they chose. So we have a smaller side console. It's an open boat, outboard motor, electrical fire. Okay, so of course the question is, why do we do drills? Well, we're just getting the smaller of the three boats ready for some electronics installation. Yeah, this is five seconds. Now, if you've been on a boat this size out on the water, that smoke would be very apparent very quickly. Okay, now imagine that you have never done a drill on your boat and this was your boat, right? Or this is a boat you're out on with, um, you know, family, a family member or something like that. Do you have a chance of extinguishing this fire? I would say, yeah. If, if you have a functioning fire extinguisher, the right type of fire extinguisher, it's readily available and you can get to it quick enough. But how do you ensure that? Ensure it through practicing, right? That's a lot of smoke. That could be really scary. Even to a trained crew to see smoke coming out like that. And this is only five seconds, right? Think about this. One, 1,000, two, 1,000. 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. There's really your window. That was your window to identify that there is a problem, that it is most likely a fire, to retrieve your fire extinguisher to locate the fire and to deploy it. Right? So what happens if we miss that window? So for an average fire department, a good response just to get on the boat and untie and go out is 20, 15, 20 minutes. And that's pretty quick. Some of these fires could have been prevented had the installations of, say, the electronics been to ABYC standards. There's the use of wire nuts, and wire nuts are not intended for marine use. Also, there were some uh, wires that were basically too small for the current they're expected to carry. So anytime you have worked on your boat, you want to make sure you use an ABYC certified technician. Don't do the wiring yourself. Take it to somebody, spend a few dollars, get it done correctly. Okay, so we have a different type vessel here and we have a different origination, different source of the fire engine compartment. So again, keep in mind the timing of this, right? They give us a nice clock to look at. Uh, Boat US provides a nice timer from first smoke, and then it time lapses a bit to see how quickly they progress. And again, keep in mind that you're going to have to go through all of the emergency firefighting procedures, make radio calls, right, which we'll get into. But think about all the things that you have to do and how quickly it needs to be done. And then go back to, your, you know, to our question, why should we do drills? Time is, was the number one factor. We had a timer running, and by three minutes, the smoke would have driven anybody off the boat. So if you're on board on a casual day. Now, many of us have learned um, fire safety since you know we were very young. And you have probably heard before how dangerous smoke is. In a house fire, for instance, it is often unfortunate when there are fatalities, it's often smoke inhalation. Right, so you saw the amount of smoke there. So perhaps within a couple minutes, that engine fire, the fire itself would have been able to have been put out. But is it safe at that point? Are you really risking 
your own life and your crewmate's life if you're still aboard at that three minute mark when they, when they open the compartment. Day with a family and, and something like this happens, you've got less than three minutes before you have to abandon ship. And are you prepared to do that? One thing I quickly saw was when the firefighter tried the uh, typical onboard fire extinguisher, uh, it was basically useless. Speed, uh, just how quickly both of these boats went up was very shocking. And you can tell that if uh, it was a live situation, you're on the boat out on the water, you do not have much time to think and act. Uh, it needs to be immediate. anyone ever wants to believe that their boat is going to catch fire so therefore they don't think it would be so useless to have your life jacket <laughs> tucked into a little cabin a little cuddy cabin a little pocket somewhere wow if nothing else know exactly where your life jacket is preferably on your body everybody thinks this wouldn't happen but if it happens to you you probably don't have enough time to really react unless you're fully prepared. I'm a big proponent of handheld VHF as a backup to a fixed mount VHF. In some of these situations, you could have worked your way to the bow and used the handheld where the fixed mount would have been either engulfed or too close to the fire. One of the things that, that seeing this demo has, has brought home to me is that you really have the responsibility for you, your family, and your friends to, to figure out what may go wrong, whether it does or not, and be ready for it. So to me, it begs the question, who's responsible for safety? Well, on the vessel, we all are, right? If it's our vessel and we are a part of that crew, we are all responsible and having an organized station bill will clearly define before an emergency who is responsible for what. So what are drills and why do we do them? Plain English, it's performing a training exercise. I told you it's a simple question, simple answer. What's a drill? You're performing a training exercise. But the goal tonight is to give you the tools to plan your own training exercises. Okay, so where do you start when you're planning any event? With an official planning session. Right now, this could be informal. Right? You don't necessarily need uh, everyone sitting around a big table. You could, uh, but the proper planning is required for a successful drill. And what's a successful drill? First, no one gets hurt, number one. Number two, everyone makes it to the location on the vessel they are responsible for, and they're able to carry out their duty in that particular emergency drill. And something to remember about drills. Let me think about, you know, whether it's drills at school or you know, drills for sports, or if you play an instrument, you do drills playing notes and things. Drill has this idea of being monotonous and repetitive. Well, it is repetitive, but it shouldn't be just going through the motions. Now, a lot of my slides tonight, you can take and make a checklist out of, right? You can customize a lot of it to fit your vessel and your crew, but you can make a checklist. But what I don't want you to fall into is complacency. If your ship already does safety drills, that's fantastic. But don't think because 
you're well drilled, that you don't have to do it anymore, or you don't have to take each drill seriously. Right? It doesn't mean that you can't do it with a smile. It doesn't mean that you can't share fellowship and camaraderie with your shipmates while you're doing a drill. But it does mean that you have to be focused because drills have multiple purposes. Whether you know it or not, the more you drill, and if you are drilling faithfully, right, you're focused on the mission at hand, your confidence increases. Right? Your confidence on that vessel increases. Your confidence as a mariner increases. Think back to how fast those fires spread in those controlled burns on those boats. I'll go back to this point. The very first boat we saw, from the time smoke started, could that fire be put out? Yes. Is it going to help and probably enhance your chance of success and reduce the risk of injury and having to abandon ship if you're well drilled? Yes. Because you're going to be confident that you know where the equipment is, you know how to get there, and you know what to do. Every time we go through these drills, you're building a certain muscle memory, so to speak. It's also to sharpen your skills. Whether it's your second fire drill on a vessel or your 50th, each time, you should be improving, whether that's something physically, whether it's something mentally, or whether it's with the vessel itself, perhaps a better layout. Perhaps it's a different place that we're going to keep life jackets, so hopefully we're wearing our PFDs, but I've seen many vessels where they're stowed and would have been burned up in many of those scenarios. Or about accessibility, To any of the equipment that you might need. And hopefully that increases your working knowledge with each drill. And of course, as you become proficient and confident in going through these drills, you also become a teacher and perhaps a mentor to new scouts that are either new to your ship, new to the vessel, and perhaps new to emergency drills. Okay, so what should you do? Well, plan the scenario. All three of those boats that we saw in the controlled burn gave a scenario, right? It's an engine fire. Uh, it's a fire from an electronic device, you know, device plugged in, looks like a coffee maker inside of that cabin cruiser. Plan a scenario and the environment. Are we going to do this dockside? Are we going to be tied up and moored? Are we going to be doing this drill underway? That whole, adds a whole different element, different level of risk. Right? You have to plan the scenario. And the planning doesn't have to be secret, right? Share the scenario with the whole crew. Because on the same vessel, each drill you do, you can add something or take away something to make it a little bit different that could mimic something that actually could happen on your vessel. And again, this is where you really have to think. Right? We're, not, we're not able to see in the future, but we can, with good analysis, look at our vessels and think, what could cause fire on this vessel? Some types of vessels, there are a lot less risk factors. And some vessels, there's many more risk factors. But truly, there's never a zero risk factor. All right, so plan out a scenario. Where is the pretend fire going to start on the boat and how? What type of fire is it? Create a drill card. So a drill card 
can be customizable. Right? There's a lot of examples. But a drill card is related to your station bill. Right? Your station bill has the crew members and what they are responsible for during that drill or during an emergency. You can take the things that they are responsible for from the station bill and put them on a drill card. And so when you're running a drill, say you have six crew members. You can have a designated, perhaps the most experienced crew member or adult leader not participate in the drill, but be an observer. And observers are very important. And the observer should be someone that is very experienced in whatever type of drill you're doing. Right, and so we're gonna kind of go through the steps in a little bit of, you know, well, what should we be looking for for fire? But have it all written out. And as the tasks are being done, have them check off, right? When you're designing your drill, assign responsibilities for drill execution. And that's right from the station bill. Who is going to do what? Who is steering? Who is making the radio call? Who is actually grabbing the fire extinguisher? And something I can't emphasize enough, when we think of a drill, yes, we wanna make it realistic. Not realistic to the point that we actually set something on fire on our boats, but realistic in the sense of location on the vessel, what started the fire, getting all of the equipment out, right? Don't just say, oh, I am going to go grab the extinguisher in a drill, you have to do it. Right, that's the type of extinguisher and saying that I'm going to grab it. That's part of classroom learning, which is very important. Right? You have to have the knowledge, but the drill is to be able to apply that knowledge. And you wanna come up with some words that help make the drill a valuable learning experience for everyone. The first thing is, even if everyone all the crew sat in and helped create the station bills and they helped think of the scenario, the firefighting scenario for the vessel and everyone knows it's a drill, you still wanna make very clear that this is a drill. If you're in a, in a location where say a marina and you're doing this moored up and someone could possibly mistake your actions, your drill as a true emergency, Think about this in planning. Should you notify anyone beforehand? Right? But even for everyone on the vessel, you want to state clearly, this is a drill. You want to have some sort of code word to stop the drill while you're doing it, not end it necessarily, but stop it. In the Coast Guard, we usually call this a training timeout. And the training timeout is necessary if a situation becomes unsafe, someone forgets what to do, or say a crew member notices another crew member at their station bill missing something. Maybe they're missing, missing um, required gear. Maybe they made an unsafe move. Maybe they skipped a step. And so you call a safety timeout or a training timeout and talk about it. And it's a teachable moment right, where everybody learns something. And drills are made for us to get better at this. And then you always want to be perfectly clear when the drill is over, right? End drill. Drill is complete. We are done the drill. And then so you have those words in place and make sure everybody understands them. Right? then you actually have to execute the drill as a team. Okay, if you're, say, doing your scenario is um, an engine fire, okay, you conduct your drill where the OD is in command, right? your helmsman 
is hopefully you haven't lost steering. You're still steering. You have someone, whoever's on your station bill, not actually make a radio call, but talk through the script of the radio call, which we'll go over a little later. Whoever is designated, whether it's one person or five people, has you know deckhands that are actually going to be taking fire extinguishers or fire blankets and um, or water if it's you know a type A fire. Have them actually take the equipment, the gear, go to where the fire is, right? Actually do the drill, as if the emergency was happening. And then there's a little imagination that goes in with this, right? If you're fighting a fake fire, at some point, you know, you have to say, okay, the fire is out. So what do you do after the drill? You always, you always debrief. You come together and you talk about it. And it shouldn't be one or two people, right? Set up a round robin or you just go around and everyone that participated in the drill, in, and I'd usually save the observer for last, but everyone that participated in the drill talks about any challenges or problems, um, anything they noticed that could have been done better, um, just positive reinforcement. If you, know, you were on point and the drill went really well, right? it's, it's that chance to um, provide feedback, feedback, and everyone should keep feedback. And um, OD or adult leader, you want to keep a log of all the drills that you conduct. That's the basic information. Your time, date, location. What were the conditions? You could do the same, same drill in two different conditions, right? Maybe you do the drill once in colder weather and once in warmer weather, and it can make a big difference, right? Just something as simple as temperature. Right? But there's other things. Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? Right? The names of all the participants. And you don't necessarily have to time your drills, at least when you're starting, because they are opportunities for learning and development of your skills. But if you do time them, note how long it took you. Okay, this little snapshot from the eagle, which is the Coast Guard bark. Cadets at the Coast Guard Academy and um, officers in officer, um, the officer candidate school train aboard the eagle. And you'll see here's the observer in the red hat, not in firefighting gear. Okay, and the acronym FIRE. Be prepared to abandon ship. We saw how fast that spreads, right? Find, find the fire. Inform. In our cases, we probably won't have passengers. Everyone will probably be crew. Restrict, right? Cut off the air supply. Again, we're not getting into the technicals of firefighting because that's not really tonight and extinguish the fire, probably using the pass method with an extinguisher. And break the drills into chunks for training opportunities, right? Maybe you don't wanna run through a whole drill, but you want to practice specific parts. Maybe you're practicing scripts for a radio call. Maybe you're practicing everyone just getting to their location on the vessel. Maybe you're practicing retrieving fire extinguishers. Okay, and just for a little context on larger vessels and commercial vessels, there's all sorts of hatches and valves and drains that either have to be opened or closed. And, and um, these are just some pictures of a few of the sheets that I had to study when I was aboard um, the larger cutters in my area of responsibility to go through and open and close the necessary um, hatches and valves and drains and things like that and report them via radio. And there I am.
It's always preferable to prevent a fire than to fight one, but still do your fire drills. Okay, abandoned ship. This one is a lot less lengthy. I know we're running a little um, short on time, uh, but this, uh, this is very interesting. Perhaps the most difficult part of abandoning ship is making the decision to debark, to get off the boat, right? We saw those fire examples. When do you decide, okay, this is, how, you know, this, is, this is a threat to life. We need to get off this vessel, right? Um, sometimes it might, from those images, might be very obvious. Sometimes it's not. Uh, I, I chose a picture of this young man. His name's Joshua Catlett. And unfortunately, um, he lost his life in 2013. Um, he was a fellow from my part of the world. I graduated high school with his older brother. And this young man was in my uh, sister's, younger sister's graduating class. He was a commercial crabber. And unfortunately, um, he was dredging near Cape May, New Jersey, in the Delaware Bay, I think for conch. And um, his dredge line got a snag. And for years, this was 2013, for years, people, and it, this is a small oyster and crab town, by the way, where they catch oysters and, and uh, crabs. The question always is, at what point, or was there a point before capsizing, could the call have been made to abandon ship? The other crewmates did survive. All right, so the hardest part about abandoned ship is making the decision. If you're going to abandon ship, you're going to be in the water, right? Unless you have a lifeboat or a life raft right, or dinghy. So depending where you're boating, you know, if you're offshore, you probably have that type of equipment. If you are inland, in bays, if you are on rivers, on lakes, you probably don't have this equipment, you are probably going to get wet. And we do have to remember that it does not, the water does not have to be very cold for eventually hypothermia to set in. If you're going to abandon ship, send out a mayday message. Now we saw in the case of that fire, if you only had a fixed VHF radio that was attached near the helm, it might not be usable, which is why in the video, it suggested the, to have a handheld VHF. Maybe one with DSC with the selective calling or an EPIRB device, right? Emergency position indicator, radio beacon. They'll send out your signal to the Coast Guard or to some dispatcher and they're very accurate, right? But getting in the water, this is where other survival training comes in. And hopefully everyone already has their, their PFDs on. If not, you have to make sure everyone dons their PFDs. And depending, you know, if there are, if it's a crew of four or five people, you should be able to visually see that everyone is there. But if it's a larger crew, or if you have guests, you wanna try to plan to have a central location, which is where the drill comes in. Where do we go after we hear abandoned ship, right? Someone is gonna be calling in the mayday and then joining. Where do we all go and where are we entering the water? So again, that's gonna depend on your boat, where you typically boat at, and do you have all your safety gear ready to come with you? Okay, if you're in a populated area in a lake where there's a lot of boaters and you're probably gonna get assistance, that's a very different story than if you're sailing offshore and there's not another vessel in sight, right? Then you may need, you're going to need food and water, or you're gonna need signaling devices and all that sort of thing. Hey, abandoned ship looks a little bit different on uh, Coast Guard cutters. Um, I've participated in both types where we just muster or get together physically at one point on the ship where we would actually enter the water. And then the other type is you actually do get in the water. So again, in this scenario, not every single crew member of the 105 uh, gets in the water because the ship still has to be operating. Right? You still have to have people operating the ship. Um, but this is, again, is for drill purposes. And then you can see some, um, some of the survival training here where we huddle into groups and release the fluorescent green dye so that um, Passing airplanes, which are probably going to be the first search and rescue vehicle deployed, can 
better locate us. And here you see one of the observers uh, basically taking attendance, taking roll up muster, making sure everyone is present and accounted for, and it'll radio that to the captain. All right, so again, any drill, plan a scenario. Right, make the decision and give the signal. Gather at your predetermined location on the vessel. Right, you don't actually have to get in the water. Right, but um, maybe that is part of your training. Right, maybe, um, you know, maybe your ship has survival suits that you need to learn how to uh, get into quickly. Right, that can all be part of it. And again, after every drill, debrief. Okay, so this was taken from a Coast Guard cutter, uh, the damage controlman, right? A lot of them are firemen on the ship as well. Um, they really have an ethos of don't give up the ship, but there may always be a time when there is no choice left. Time and tide wait for no man, man overboard or MOBs. Okay, hopefully we all know this one. Now, this clip art was free, so I know it's a little corny, but you know, here's the big problem I have with both of these uh, clip art pictures. So nobody's wearing a life jacket here. Okay. Somebody falls overboard. First thing you do, almost all of you probably know this, right? Whoever sees it, your point, you're shouting, man overboard, man overboard, as loud as you can. You need to get everyone's attention you possibly can. And you pass the call along until everyone hears it, right? Shout, point. Who are you pointing at? The person in the water, the PIW, person in the water. And you keep your eyes on them. So this guy is turned, not good, right? You want to keep your eyes on the person in the water and point, right? So hopefully on your vessel, the helmsman can see you. And if not, another crew member is able to relay the hand position, right? Station bills can be a little funny here because you never know who is going to fall overboard. So you've lost one of your station bills and whoever saw that person, right, um, is now taken out for a time while they're pointing and shouting man overboard, right? But you can have someone else in a station bill who is the thrower. They're going to throw out a life ring perhaps a datum, right? a dance buoy, something to mark where the person is in the water. Right? That's what you do first. So what's going on on the bridge or the helm? Right? You gotta initiate that turn. You have to get back to where the person is in the water. If you have a GPS, some of the Garmin's I've seen you know, have the man overboard button integrated. Transmit a distress call. Now, does it have to be a mayday? Not necessarily, right? If you're on a calm lake on a summer day and one of you just, and you're wearing your PFD and you're in the water and your boat's at anchor and your crewmate just needs a hand and he's right there saying, oh, how stupid. I just, I just slipped off the gunnel while I tried to sit down. Shouldn't sit on the gunnel, why, right? And all you have to do is give him a hand to pull him back in that may not require a mayday call, right? Mayday is for imminent threat to someone's life and the complete loss of the boat, right? As the vessel is approaching the person back in the water, have to assess, is the person injured? Are they conscious, right? To the best of your ability, it can be very tough to determine from deck, but to the best of your ability, and then it's going to depend, how are you going to recover? How are you going to pull this person out of the water? Right, and there are many different methods and sometimes it's brute force, but you don't wanna cause or exacerbate any existing injuries, right? So that's a whole nother course in and of itself of proper recovery methods, right? But recover the person in the water and assess and treat the person according to your level of training. We're talking first aid, treating for shock. Just be aware when a person falls overboard on our smaller vessels, right? That J22 I had up earlier, the small center console, where everyone is kind of in visual contact with each other, you'll probably notice right away. But still, after three seconds, 
you know, depending how fast you're traveling, you could be 50 to 70 feet away, right? And that turn is going to have to get you back on course 180 degrees behind you. Again, this is a whole topic in and of itself, but what can you do during a drill? Well, this is really a lot of skill and practice into, into getting the turnaround down, right? When I took ASA 101, and I am not a very proficient sailor, I'll just throw that out there, right? I do the figure eight, right? When we practice man overboard. Now, but there are different types of turns, obviously, depending on whether you're under sail, you're under power, um, where the wind is coming from. If you're under sail, that's going to be huge because you have to get up to the best you can to the person in the water at a close reach, All right? But just know these are things you could practice in your drill, right? You could, you could pretend that there's something in the water if it's safe to do so, you know, maybe a life ring or, you know, some sort of small buoy is your mark. And I've included some links um, that give you uh, two different perspectives on approaches, the types of turns, and approaching a person in the water, particularly when you're under sail. All right, we're running a little short on time. So this will be in the presentation that is posted. It will be um, posted on the YouTube channels. Um, it's short, maybe three to four minutes, but this is a uh, man overboard drill on a 45 foot response boat medium with the US Coast Guard. So it can show you how um, a small crew drills for man overboard, right? This is a smaller platform. So it'll be more applicable, I think, to the types of vessels that we'll mostly find ourselves on. But here's a still photo anyway, right? So when, uh, when the Coast Guard practice these, usually they use a dummy called Oscar. Uh, the Oscar we used on the 270s was five foot 11 and 100 pounds. And um, the training team knew where Oscar was going to be, where and when Oscar was going to be tossed overboard, but the rest of us did not. And my particular uh, station bill was BDS, Battle Dressing Station, which is basically a stretcher bearer and first aid provider. And yes, after we got Oscar out of the water, they would always come up with some medical scenario for Oscar so that we had to either treat him on deck or load him up onto the stretcher and get him to a place to be treated. You do not have to go out and buy an $800 Oscar though to practice your man overboard drill. If you want a good visual in the water again, you know, a buoy, um, you know, the Chesapeake Bay area, we're very familiar with crab traps, crab pot buoys, you know, something like that would work just fine. Okay, and again, to make the comparison, uh, if you do get a chance to go uh, to the presentation um, and check out the, um, check out the uh, 45 foot response boat medium, uh, you'll see that really there are four crew members there, right? And this is just one example of a small, well, you know, or I shouldn't say small, but a portion of the station bill for man overboard on the 270. Um, J bar davit recovery detail means the boat that goes over. On those size cutters, they have two small boats. And the davit is basically the crane that swings them over and lowers them down. And so you have all the people that would be at the davit where the small boat is going down, plus the number of people on the small boat, including, um, including a rescue swimmer. Actually, they'd be called cutter swimmers. And another component that you can add into all three of these drills, whether it's fire, abandoned ship, or man overboard, you're likely going to have some sort of, you know, minor to extreme medical 
issue to deal with from someone, right? With fire, it could be burns, it could be smoke inhalation, um, it could be heat exhaustion, it could be heat stroke, right? All sorts of medical situations, right? So involving some basic CPR and even treatment for shock with every drill is, um, is, a, is an excellent add-on to all three drills. And I have pictures here because on a ship, the wardroom where the officers have some meetings like navigation briefs and eat their meals, um, all this is cleared out and there's gear stowed all where we can't see it, even in the ceiling, um, to turn this into an operating theater for very severe injuries. And then this is a picture of training on the mess deck where um, all of the enlisted crew eats their meals. So you can do training anytime, anywhere, as long as you have the willingness and you have someone knowledgeable and qualified to give you the training. Okay, um, there is a Mayday script in the Sea Scout manual, so I won't, you know, bore you with it all, but Mayday is for an imminent threat to life where the whole ship, the whole boat is going, you know, going to burn to the waterline, right? You're abandoning ship, you're doing a Mayday call. Pon Pon is a call for assistance. You need help, but there probably isn't an immediate threat to life or losing the vessel, right? That could be a mechanical issue. And security is information like bad weather, okay? But this is a Mayday script, right? And this is something that you can drill for. You can include this, should include this in your whole drill if you're gonna do a Mayday call, or this is something that you can practice. I would also suggest having the script somewhere near the VHF. Turn it, you know, in an actual call, you'd turn to channel 16. Never actually engage channel 16 unless you're having an emergency, right? Don't call on it. It's not a hailing station. This is for, it's an emergency monitored station, channel. I shouldn't say station, channel. But it's always important. Mayday, 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 right? Give all the information you can, what the nature of your, your emergency is. And again, a mayday is threat to life or imminent loss of the vessel. How many people you have on board, right? And any other information that you can give. And again, if you have a VHF with DSC or an EPIRB, all the better. Um, that's, that's akin to a mayday call in itself. Okay, so the important takeaways. The time to train is now. Even if you're not doing a whole drill, again, break the dr drills down into chunks. You're gonna need gear for these drills. You're going to need equipment for all these drills. Make sure you're training to get to that gear as quickly as possible. You know where it is, even in low visibility, because it could be dark, there could be smoke, right? So practice accessing it, taking it out, all right, practice using it to the extent that you can and is legal. Don't set off flares when you don't need to. Don't make uh, mayday calls, uh, but you can go through the motions, right? And make sure everybody on your crew, regardless of their station bill, is training on your gear. Drills help you develop that muscle memory. And I'm sure maybe you have yourself been in an emergency situation and how do we remain calm? You know, people say remain calm. Well, how do you remain calm? How do you remain focused? Right? It's, it's when you hear people say the phrase, the training kicked in. Right? It doesn't mean that you're not nervous, but it means you're not panicking. You have something to do. You know what to do. And that muscle memory helps you do it. Okay? So whether you're starting out by making your um, station bills, or you're going to plan a fire drill or a man overboard drill or abandoned ship, collaborate with your shipmates and adult leaders. Okay. And when I say address training gaps, um, if there's a need for, say, CPR training or first aid training, um, or someone doesn't know how to use a fire extinguisher, right? Um, anything like that, properly work a radio, a VHF radio, right? Address that training. Yes, it could be done during a timeout in the drill, but that's a great topic to do together outside of the drill. 
and then plan your next drill by creating a drill card or a checklist, right? What are all the things that we should do in the fire drill? Get it on paper and have an observer during the drill go through and check off that everything got done. And then share those results in the debrief. Talk about it, right? Share your experience with each other. Okay, that took us to the end of our hour. And I will advertise uh, our next tech talk, which is related to some of the things we got into today. Um, fire drill, but we didn't really go into the nature and science of fire and effective ways to fight different types of fire, particularly on a vessel. So February 22nd at 9 p.m. Eastern, um, we will be having our next tech talk on fire. Okay. So let's check our time here. 10.05, so we're a little late. Um, if you have any questions, I can try and address them. If you need to log off, I understand. Um, this should be recorded, so if we do have questions, I may be able to answer a few. So, PJ, that was excellent, extremely detailed. Uh, one question was, can we get a copy of the uh, slides? And if you send that to me, that can go out in the uh, thank you email for everyone who attended. Yes, um, as soon as we log off here, I will be happy to send you the presentation. Again, I, I think I put a little too much in there. I didn't get to the uh, man overboard uh, video on the 45. So that would be great for people to, to check out. And um, Again, some of the slides you can use to create your own checklists. And the reason that a generic template doesn't quite work is because a lot of the templates are designed for specific shipping industries or they're designed for a specific government vessel, which really don't reflect um, all of the steps that we would need to do on, say, uh, you know, a, a 40 foot o day. Exactly. Well, this is a great way to kick off 2022. Thank you all for attending, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you, and take care.